Welcome back guys. Today we will be talking about the Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate offered on Coursera, especially with the new updates that have been added. This program provides a comprehensive, beginner-friendly introduction to cybersecurity and prepares individuals for entry-level cybersecurity roles. In this review, we'll explore the strengths and limitations of the Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate and how it compares to other certificates in the market. Also, we will take on practical assignment that's part of the hands-on labs of the course. Specifically, we will go over investigating logs and creating rules with Suricata IDS. The Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate is structured as a series of courses having eight courses in total. You will learn foundations of cybersecurity, networking fundamentals, security monitoring and incident response, threat intelligence and vulnerability assessment, security operations, and above all, you will also learn how to run SQL queries, use Python programming to create automation scripts, and use CM tools such as Splunk for incident investigation. Each module is designed to provide students with essential cybersecurity skills, with a focus on hands-on practice through simulations and labs created by QWiklabs and using Jupyter Notebooks to run code samples. The certificate is designed to be completed in three to six months with a recommended pace of about 10 hours per week. However, learners can complete it at their own pace. The content is heavily focused on preparing students for entry-level roles and does not delve deeply into advanced cybersecurity topics, making it ideal for beginners. The certificate is relatively affordable compared to traditional degrees, costing approximately $59 per month on Coursera. The program is also eligible for Coursera's financial aid, making it accessible for a wide audience. To pass the entire program and earn your certificate, you will have to complete all the module quizzes, the peer-to-peer -peer assignments, and the hands-on labs. It's relatively easy to do the above without hassles, I guess. Okay, so now let's discuss key strengths of this program. Being backed by Google, the certificate holds considerable weight with employers. Google's involvement enhances the program's reputation and suggests the curriculum aligns with current industry standards and needs. The certificate includes practical labs and exercises designed to mimic real-world scenarios. This hands-on component is particularly valuable as it allows learners to apply their knowledge, something crucial in the cybersecurity field where practical experience is often prioritized. You will have access to labs to practice SQL, Python, running queries in Splunk CM, creating security rules in Suricata IDS, and analyze network packets using Wireshark and TCP dump. Graduates of the Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate gain access to Google's Employer Consortium, which includes top companies looking to hire cybersecurity professionals. The course also offers career support, including resume building workshops and interview preparation, which can be beneficial for those new to the job market. The program is designed to be accessible to beginners with little or no background in cybersecurity, which differentiates it from many other certifications that assume a baseline of technical knowledge. All right, knowing that nothing is perfect, let's now discuss the limitations of this certificate. The course is focused on foundational concepts, making it suitable for entry-level positions, but lacking in advanced cybersecurity topics. Those seeking deeper technical knowledge in areas like blue teaming, penetration testing, or ethical hacking may need additional certifications. This program is not equivalent to widely recognized industry certifications such as CompTIA Security Plus or CSP. This might make it less appealing for those who want credentials that directly correspond to established certifications. Compared to CompTIA Security Plus, CompTIA Security Plus is recognized as an industry standard and is particularly useful for those looking to meet specific job requirements. Google's certificate, however, provides a broader introduction with hands-on labs, but lacks the same level of recognition. For students looking for immediate industry relevance, CompTIA Security Plus might be more advantageous. Compared to OSCP and Hack the Box CPTS, Google's certificate does not aim to prepare learners for roles in ethical hacking and lacks the depth in hacking techniques that OSCP provides. Compared to CSSP, the Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate does not aim to compete with CSSP as it is designed for beginners. CSSP is a high-level certification and requires significant experience, making it a logical choice for those looking to advance 
to leadership roles All right, guys, in cybersecurity. So as part of this course review, I'm going to take on this practical lab, which examines the process of creating security rules with the well-known intrusion detection system named Suricat. So on the left, we have Linux terminal, where we can examine the given files. So we're given a simple network capture file and the custom rules file. So what is the custom rules file here? Without going through all of these readings, so basically the custom rules is the file that we can use to create custom rules in Suricata. They are default rules and they are custom rules. So basically here, we're using a specific file to create custom rules. You can take a look at this file by using the cat command in Linux. And here we have an example rule. Let's go over the rule components. Similar to Snort intrusion detection system, Suricata rules work the same. First, we have the action. The rules action here is alert. However, we have more than one action when it comes to Suricata. So basically we have alert, we have drop, pass, and reject. So alert is just going to alert when the condition specified here or when the packets that will be examined in the packet capture here match the condition here. If one packet or more than one packet match the condition, there will be a generated alert with one alert for each packet. Drop simply is an action that uh, Suricata takes to totally drop the packet. It is an action that you can customize or you can choose to work with if you put Suricata in an intrusion prevention system, IPS mode. The pass is similar to alert. We let the packet pa uh, pass specified here. The pass action allows the traffic to pass through the network interface. The pass rule can be used to override other rules, meaning it can be used to create an exception. Other actions we can take with Suricata to treat the traffic, it is the reject rule. The reject is similar to drop, in which we are actually rejecting the incoming or the outgoing packet. But the difference is, with reject, we send a TCP reset packet. In drop, we don't send a, res a TCP reset packet, we just drop the packet entirely. Okay, now here we have the action. Next, we have the, pa the rule header. The rule header starts with the protocol and ends with the destination port. So that's the part where we examine the header. The header starts with the protocol being examined. Next, with the source IP address or the source network. In this case here, there is a variable named homenet that's used to indicate the address of the home network. Basically, it is indicated in the coursework here that these names or these parameters can be specified in a separate file. It is located under etc suricata suricata yaml. In this file, you can define variables where these variables can be assigned single IP addresses or network IP addresses, and then you can use the variables um, uh, here directly in a suricata rule. Next, we have any. Any is a keyword that means any port or any address. Here we use any in the port, meaning the uh, rule here will actually match the packets that originate from the home network on any source port. It is the source port here that we are matching. Any source port, it doesn't matter. That's the arrow. The arrow really indicates the direction of the packet. This row or the row that is pointed to the right indicates that it is a packet that is originating from within the network, meaning it is an outgoing packet. Likewise, a, ro a road that is pointed in the opposite direction means that it is an incoming packet. It's a packet that's coming from outside. Okay, so here we are matching packets originating from within the network, specifically the home network on any source port. But where are these packets destined? So basically we're aiming to match the packets that are destined to the external network here usually the external network is the internet and any with any destination ip address so if we put everything together with the explanation we did it means that this rule will actually match all the http packets meaning it will match the network or browsing activity of the users inside the network next here we have the other section of the rule so scrolling down we have the rule options this is the rule options. The rule options start when you see the parentheses because the rule options are enclosed within parentheses and they are separated with semicolon. So the semicolon is the end of every uh, option here. The options are used to narrow down the packets more. So yeah, we have here the rule header. We are matching the uh, browsing or the web activity within the network. But furthermore, we want to 
um, narrow down the filtering. So we're not yet done yet with the web activity because this, is, this will match a wide range of packets. The log file will be huge. Therefore, we are using the rule options here to narrow down the matching criteria here. So we start with the message. The message indicates, or we use the message here to uh, tell the user that why we are actually triggering the alert. Get on wire. This is the statement that you will see in the logs, okay, or in the alerts. So wherever an alert is triggered as a result of this rule, you will see the message get on wire. That's a reference, or it can be used as a reference to why we are triggering this rule. Then we have the flow of the packets. So it will match the packets that are established, means they are in the uh, network state of established. We have established, we have listen, we have uh, uh, waiting. So we are only matching established packets. If you don't know, if you know how to use netstat, you must have seen this keyword when examining the network activity of a specific host. So here we have, if we come up with the, come from here, and we examine the network activity of my machine, we must see the keyword established here. So we are matching established sessions, not time wait and not other uh, states. Okay, moving on to server. So usually when we connect to an address such as this one, we're actually establishing a client server connection here. So we are only targeting the requests to the websites sent by the users. So meaning it's actually another word of saying we are tracking the web activity of users. The content here, we're tracking the get requests. And then we have the method of the HTTP. This ID is the signature of the rule here. And then we have the repetition. So whenever we make a change on this rule, we are actually creating a new version of this rule. So we increase this by one, or we increment this by one, indicating that we have actually edited the rule. It's used to, um, you know, uh, track the changes. Okay, the next thing we want to do after we have examined the structure of the Suricato rule, we want to see where are the logs will be created. What are the logs? Basically, the logs are the alerts that are generated as a result of matching this rule. So usually we have CD VR Suricata or log. As you can see, this directory now is empty because we haven't run Suricata yet. Once we run Suricata and once we have packets that match the conditions specified here, we're going to have many log files. Some of the log files are in JSON format and other log files are in just text format. So it is also specified here. As you can see, we can have two log files, fastlog and eve. The main one that we need to work with is the eve or the one with JSON. The other one is in log format. Let's, let's have a look here. So in order to create this file, we're going to have to run Suricata against uh, the packet capture. All right, it's also specified here how to do that. This is the command. You can copy this. We're going to go over this command. So sudo suricata-r, we are supplying a packet capture. Similar to uh, T-Shark or Zeek IDS. If you have watched my videos on T-Shark and Zeek, you'll know what I'm talking about. Dash S, here we are using a custom rule. If you, have, if you don't specify dash S followed by the name of the rule file, suricata will run or will examine the packet capture based on the default rules that come with suricata once you install it and then we have dash k none it means we are not going over the checksum of the packets okay next thing we want to do here we want to run this uh pika file does not exist right because we're gonna have to go to the we have to go back to the home directory of the user see the analyst okay we run the command Now, if we check VR, now we have the log files. If we examine the fast log, then I have to specify the directory again. Here we have these. Let's go over these. So what are these? These are the alerts generated by Suricata. We have two alerts here. That's the second one. And that's the first one. Every alert starts with the timestamp, right? So here means that Suricata have, uh, has actually matched two packets. That's why it has generated two alerts. So this means we have two packets that have matched the condition specified in the custom rule file. And here we have the message get on wire. This is a reference to which rule the packets have matched. In this case, it has the packets have matched this rule. And then we have the source IP address 
meaning the endpoint or the client that has initiated the connection. That's the source port on the client machine. And that's the address or the IP address of the website that they have visited. If you now examine the other log file, which is the JSON file, <coughs> look at this. This is a JSON log file. So in order to examine this efficiently, it is also specified in the coursework here that you can use the JQ tool. I've also covered this in my videos. It's a tool that's used to parse JSON files and extract insights more efficiently. In my case here, if I run JQ here and use dot to indicate that I want the output of the tool to be stored in the current working directory, and then I specify the path to the log file I am parsing. So Eve, and then I can use uh, less because I want to use less to browse through the file. This is the output file. See now the output has been beautified so that it is human readable. And this is the uh, rules that have been matched. So this is the first one, right? And we also have the severity. And then we can use uh, B or C, sorry, the space to navigate through the other uh, alerts. Okay, in the task, we also are asked to find the value of the severity of the first alert. It can easily be found here. That's the first alert, and the severity is three. In the other question here, we have we are asked to extract fields from the JSON file named Eve, and we mentioned that JQ can be used to accomplish just that. Uh, before we use it to extract, or before we use JQ for field extraction, we're gonna have to find or determine what we want to extract. In the example here, it is determined that we want to extract the timestamp, the flow ID, the alert signature, the protocol, and destination IP. All these fields can be found easily in the alerts. So as you can see, this is the timestamp field, this is the flow ID, this is the source port and destination uh, source IP and source port, and we have the protocol. So all these fields can be found here. Now with JQ, you can just specify the fields and have them extracted from all the alerts, no matter how many of them are found in the JSON file. So JQ, well, let me just copy that, it's gonna be way easier. Take a look at this. As you can see between every field, that's the first one, every field is preceded by full stop and then followed by a comma. That's how we, uh, that's uh, the uh, syntax of using JQ and then we specify the path to the log file. If we hit enter, as you can see, the fields are, or have been extracted from the file. The timestamp, and then we have the signature ID, the flow ID, and then we have the alert signature, the protocol, that's alert signature, that's the protocol, and that's destination IP. What is the destination IP address listed for the last event in the Eve JSON file? So the last event IP is this one. And what is the alert signature? The alert signature is this. It is the reference to which, alert, to which rule uh, that's matched through the packets. And lastly, we have uh, okay, so that was that's an example coursework or example lab from this course, which you will be uh, doing in case you wanted to enroll in this course. Okay, so my final verdict on Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate is that it is suitable for beginners in the field of cybersecurity. It's still an industry recognized certificate, and it proves that the candidate has gained foundational knowledge in cybersecurity, especially in the defensive domain. And if you add a college degree in computer science or information technology, it may be useful to get an entry level role. So eventually, if you are a beginner in this field and want a quick and easy way in, then Google Cybersecurity Professional Certificate is suitable for you. And it can act as a coursework for more advanced certificates such as CompTIA Security Plus and CompTIA Cybersecurity Analyst. However, if you are already in the cybersecurity domain and have some experience, then this program can just refresh your knowledge and be a good add to your resume. Check out the video description for a detailed write-up and review on Cybersecurity Professional Certificate. Cheers!